going all in is not easy. It's very difficult. You have to decide within your heart and within your mind, am I willing to be second instead of first? Am I willing to allow Christ to make some decisions for me? Now, we may not audibly hear Christ, but what we have is the Word of God so we can hear His heart and know what we could or we should do. Sometimes the Holy Spirit does communicate to us. But going all in means I'm putting Christ at the center of my life. I'm allowing the Word of God to communicate through my heart and to apply within my actions. Going all in is hard. Because my ways are not His ways. And sometimes His ways do not make sense to me. Sometimes He asks me to do things that I don't want to do. Sometimes He asks me things that I'm good at. I, I can do that. But uh, we, we went to Osborne this week to sheetrock a church. And everybody that went with me knew that I don't know much about sheetrock. <laughs> My hands were all cut up. I had blood all over the place. And these guys were out there cutting all this sheetrock, doing everything. And they were fine. But I was walking down leaving blood on the doors. And it's like, Bruce, you're an idiot. I, I understand. I don't know anything about sheetrock. Um, but the Lord said, let's do this. Whether you're good at something or not. When he asks you to do, what do you do? You do what he asks you to do. Sometimes you have to get your booty off the stool and let Christ on the stool. So if Jesus loved the church so much that he went all in and gave his life for the church, church, what we have to do is we have to go all in in the church. The body of Christ. The scripture that we've used all week, all month is Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. Follow me. How, how do we see Christ? If, if, if I was going to follow Christ, then I could see him. I, I could do what he asked me to do. But how can I follow an invisible God how can I follow Christ when I cannot see him? Folks, that's what the church is all about. We are the body of Christ. And what we do together is we learn what Christ wants us to do. And how do we do that? We do that through peers. We do that through the word of God. We do that through the authority of the church so we can learn to be a follower of Christ, not just sometimes, not when I want to do it, not when I do what I want to do. Sometimes we have to do what Christ wants us to do, and sometimes it's not necessarily easy. Sometimes it's very difficult. The greatest way to go all in is with your life. Sometimes it's not easy. God doesn't see the church as a building. God sees the church as a body. If 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 if, if this church was burnt down yesterday and the building was completely gone, guess what we would do? I would send out a remind. And if you haven't signed up for a remind, you would have no idea where we're having church. So sign up for a remind. I would sign, send out a remind to everybody in the church, say, we have rented out campus high school's auditorium for church. The building does not make the church. The building contains the church, but the body of Christ is the church. We are the church. Sometimes we say, well, this is my church. This is where I go to church. No, we are the body of Christ. In Romans chapter 12, verse 5, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individual members of one another. We are the body. Some of you are the hands, some of you are the feet, some of you are the brains. But we all make up a body. Every one of us makes up the church. If the church was full of Bruce Thomases, the church would not get a lot of stuff done. If the church is full of your gifts and somebody else's gifts, and we all have different ideas and different gifts and different abilities, the Bible says Jesus brings to the body who he wants in the body to fulfill the plan that God has in store for Glenville. You are uniquely gifted to be part of a body. You may not be uniquely gifted to be part of this body, 
But if you're a child of God, God has gifted you in order to be part of the body of Christ. What we must do is understand that God did not save you to learn the Bible. God did not save you to sit in church. God did not allow you to redeem your sins to become a follower of Christ just to say, I'm going to heaven when I die. There's a bigger purpose for the church than just to learn. The purpose is to do. To absolutely love God and do what he has for us. The problem is that members are not connected to the body. And sometimes we come in and we were saved and we come into church and we enjoy the worship, we enjoy the sermon, but we do not do anything outside of Sunday morning from 1030 to 12 or some of us from 1045 to 12. It's that first 15 minutes, I'm not all into that, but after, after 15 minutes, I'll come into church. So in order to be healthy, what we must do is we have to be committed. See, that word commitment is a very difficult word, isn't it? I can be committed to some things, but really to be committed to Christ, to go all in for Christ, to allow him to make some of those decisions. In Hebrews, it talks about a church that uh, um, the, the church became just something that they did. Sometimes they'd come to church and sometimes they wouldn't come to church. If it's rainy outside, we'll all stay home. If it's snowy outside, well, I'll, I'll just not go. And, and Jesus says, guys, listen, we cannot do that. We cannot just take the church for granted. People like that makes the church an option. And if we're part of the body of Christ and you are the hands of the body and the body's hands doesn't show up to church, Something is not going to happen in that body of Christ. What does it take to go all in? I want to give you three steps and three questions that I have to give to us because the church, the body, you, we can go all in. You can go all in for the cause of Jesus Christ. It has to be a decision whether I'm going to just do Sunday morning church or I'm going to let Christ control my life. Folks, if we just come to church on Sunday but do not live a Christ-like following of Jesus during the week, we are going to be miserable. Have you ever lied to somebody? And after a few weeks, they found out your lie and they confronted you about your lie. That's also called being hypocritical. And what happens in the body of Christ when we come to church, we say, Lord, I love you. I'm going to raise my hands. I'm going to worship your name. I'm going to love you all day long. And then we walk out the door and we go to the restaurant and we cuss out the waitress. We're not really going all in, are we? Being hypocritical means I'm going to do one thing in front of somebody, but I'm going to do something else in front of anybody else. And I hope this group doesn't know who this group is because if they knew who I was on Sunday, they would not want me to act that way Monday through Saturday. But I'm going to come to church and I'm going to worship the Lord. That is not going all in. Going all in is I'm going to be the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Going all in is Jesus is the priority within my life. How do we get that? Well, the church. That's where each one of us need each other in order to become all in. Because sometimes we need somebody to call our bluff. I believe you're lying. I believe what you're doing is not right. And sometimes we all need somebody that loves us enough to call our bluff. If there's always somebody around there saying, oh, you're the greatest thing in the world. You've never done anything wrong. We're going to start believing those lies. But it's one or another, we say, you know what? Bruce, you were inappropriate. Bruce, what you did was wrong. And sometimes we need somebody within our life to call our bluff. In the body of Christ, we are fitly joined together and each and every one of us need to love each other enough that we could call each other's bluff. That's what the body of Christ is all about. So why should I become a member of the body? I walk in these doors or I come to church. Why should I be a member of the body? 
I come to church, I give, I sing. Why should I become a member to this body? You know, the, the greatest thing about the Bible, the New Testament, it just assumes something. It assumes when you are radically changed and forgiven by Jesus because of what he did on the cross for your sins. There's no place in the Bible that says, you must become a member of a church. You must sign a dotted line. It doesn't say that you join a church. What it does assume is when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you are added to the body of Christ. Because they understood when you gave your life to Christ, you are excommunicated sometimes from your family. And the body, the family, is who you have to minister to, to love, and to cherish. So when you give your life to Christ and you are baptized, it is assumed that you're part of the body of Christ because you know that you're sacrificing your desires to do what God wants you to do. If you aren't a believer and you don't have a membership, you're associated a body without a part, a child without a family, a sheep without a flock. It's easy to fall away. It's easy that coal, that wood that's on fire, that you give your life to Christ and he consumes you. But if you're not put into a place where there's other hot coals, Sooner or later, those coals or that wood will burn out. But what we do as the body of Christ on Sundays, on Wednesdays, on Sunday nights, what we do is that wood that's on fire. We come in and we place our life in front of other people that's on fire. And what we do is we grow, we learn, we are encouraged because of what God has done with others. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members and the household of God. You're no longer a foreigner. Now that you've given your life, you're part of the body of Christ, but follow fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. There's a privilege to be a fellowship of Christ. The church needs us as much as we need the church. We as the church, we need each other. The body of Christ need you. And you need the body of Christ. We had a funeral yesterday. Jake's nephew uh, passed away. And Jake and Wanda and I were sitting outside of that funeral service and we were just talking. And that conversation said this, I do not know how people get by and deal with the funeral if they did not have Christ. And as we said that, we saw people from the church, friends of theirs, come walking in. They did not know that young man from the man in the moon. But you know who they knew? They knew Jake and Wanda. And the people in the church came to that funeral, not because they knew the boy, but because they loved them. And they were in the same family as Jake and Wanda, as Justin and Charity. So they came together because they wanted to support and encourage the one that was hurting. That's what a family does. When a family is hurting, when somebody in the family is struggling, what we do is we come alongside them and say, I'm going to sacrifice what may, my plans were to do what I need to do. Sometimes we say, get off my stool, Jesus, because I want to sit down. And you know what Jesus will do? He'll stand up just like James. He'll stand up and he'll let you have your life. He doesn't make you do anything. He gives you a volitional will to do what you want. But what he does in the body of Christ is we need to learn and be trained what the Bible says. The church needs us as much as we need the church. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 and 25. And let us consider one another in order to stir up the love and the good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some. But exhorting one another... And so much as you see the day approaching. Exhorting, which means encouraging. The body of Christ encouraging. What does that mean? That doesn't mean just giving somebody a high five. That means getting in their life. And when they're struggling. When somebody dies. When a marriage is falling apart. When there's financial collapse. What we do is we come alongside them and we encourage them. We give them hope. We give them purpose. It isn't if you feel like it. It's God's mandate for us to do it. The word of encouragement. 
You know, a pastor uh, on Sunday morning when it's snowing, you know, uh, we haven't had a lot of snow last year, but a couple of years ago, we had two Sundays in a row that it snowed on Saturday night. You guys remember that? Nobody was here. And I was like, I was sitting at the front door. I said, man, I hope somebody shows up. I hope somebody shows up. And we had like 20 people here. But you know what? Praise Jesus. We had church. We didn't pay the bills, but we had church. But as a pastor, when it's snowing or when it's raining, you know, I'm sitting at those doors. And, and you know what? I love church. And I love to be able to minister. And it's frustrating when something happens. I tell God all the time, do you not know it's Saturday night? Do you not know it's Sunday morning? Do you not know your church is supposed to be? He says, Bruce, 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 shut up. I'm in charge of what takes place. And we had the smallest attendance since I've been the pastor of this church on a Sunday that it was snowing. And I don't know if you remember this, but I preached with about 25, 30 people in here. And we had two people give their life to Christ. What happens? Sometimes we're focused on the size. And Jesus cares about the heart. Whether there's two people or five people or 20 people or 30 people or 500 people, it makes no difference. What we must do is we must be an encouragement to those that walk in those doors. So, what are the benefits of being a member? No, there's physical benefits. In uh, Hebrews 10, 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the matter of some, but exhorting one another so much you see the day approaching. I read the article in the newspaper and I want to give these facts to you. So, if you want to live a safe life, here's what you have to do. Do not ride in a car. 20% of the deaths happen because you're behind the wheel. Don't stay home. 17% of the deaths happen while you're at your house. Do not walk on the sidewalks. 14% of the deaths happen while you're walking. Do not travel air, rail, or water. 16% of the deaths happen there. But in a worship service, 0.001% dies in a worship service. So we may have saved your life. Because you came to church today. Except for on Easter, if you remember this, about seven years ago, Easter Sunday morning, I was up preaching. We just had our music, and a guy sitting right down here passed out and had a heart attack. We thought he was dead. They were giving him CPR. They called the ambulance. Now, Easter Sunday morning, the biggest day of the year, Jesus. Why would you allow somebody to pass out with a heart attack on Easter Sunday morning? I didn't get to preach. I didn't share Jesus. I, it was, everybody was here. But you know what? The guy had a heart attack and he, would lie, and he lived. Went to the hospital. And it was the greatest message of Easter. How somebody was alive. And how somebody died. And how somebody came back to life. The greatest picture of what Jesus Christ did for us. He died. He was buried, and he rose again. You know what? The greatest benefit that you could have is come to church to learn. There are some physical needs. There are some emotional needs. Some of those emotional benefits in the Connecticut's Mutual Life Insurance Company stated this. Church attenders are twice as likely to have a happy home life. Church attenders believe their work contributes to society. Church attenders are more likely to reconcile than to divorce. Church attenders are six times more likely to volunteer to serve somebody else. There are some emotional benefits, and then there are some spiritual benefits. What are those spiritual benefits? Identity. We know who we are. More than anything else, if you're a child of God, your identity is not, I'm, I'm a worker, not I work for somebody. Our identity is, I'm a child of God. Of God. I'm a believer that nothing can take away. I could get fired from my job, but nothing can separate me from the love of Jesus. Maturity. We grow best when we grow together. When, when we grow together. That's our right now media. That's when we go to church. That's when we open up the word of God. We grow as a believer. We're not babies anymore. Sometimes we have to grow up, and sometimes we have to do things that we don't want to do. And sometimes in ministry, a place to discover your spiritual gifts. A place where I can serve, I can grow, I can do something for other people. And then accountability, as we talked before. Sometimes accountability is tough because it's just as hard to t confront somebody as it is to be confronted. But as I have that, we need to make sure that we are accountable. And then authority. Following 
everyone else needs to be under authority. First person we're under authority to is Jesus. We have to be under his authority. How do we become under his authority? Jesus gave us the word of God. And I don't have the right, nor do you have the right to say, I don't care what the Bible says. Because once we have given our life to Christ, the word of God is the authority that we live our life by. It has to be that way. If we ever say, I don't care what the Bible says, we're saying, I don't care for Jesus to take control of my life. So, why should I become a member? And then, what should I become as a member of the church? What? The first thing, you need to be involved. If we're going to be all in, we need to be involved. Tonight, we're going to do, uh, Pastor Al came up with this name, Chivalgo. Chile, volunteers, and go. And as we were going over all the volunteers in the church, tonight we're going to honor over 200 people that serve as a volunteer in some capacity at this church. 200. What I have to say to them is thank you. This church, this community, this children's ministry, this youth ministry, this music ministry could not be successful if it wasn't for the volunteers that say, I'm all in. I will do whatever it takes to make this thing happen. We need to be a partner to one another. What does the church of God expect of me? The church of God expects five things from you. That you're a believer in Jesus. That you're baptized in the fellowship of Christ. You join our church. You worship together. And you go. You show up. The encouragement part is we show up. We love and we help and we talk and we encourage. The difference between people who just attend church and a member of the church is commitment to the church. I'm committed. As we talked a few weeks ago, church membership is this. This is my church. We know it's Jesus' church, but this is my church. When I have to sacrifice I'm going to sacrifice to the church. When I'm struggling, I want the pastor and I want the staff to be praying for me. This is my church. When I'm struggling, I want people in the church to come alongside me to help me out. When somebody in my life dies, I want somebody to come alongside me and help me and love me. The difference between people that just attend church and the people that are membership of church is called commitment. And I, I, I use funerals quite often, but it's very easy as I do sermons and funerals for people I don't even know. It's very easy to see those that are members of a church and those that are non-attenders of a church at a funeral. Because a member of a church, the body of Christ comes alongside them. There's people there, not necessarily because they want to go to a funeral. Nobody just wants to go to a funeral. They go to a funeral because they love somebody that's hurting. And when they love somebody that's hurting, they're coming alongside them and, and they'll get up and they'll get off work because they want to minister to somebody. What we must do is we must absolutely take care of those. And then the last question I'd like to spend some time on is, where should I belong as a member of the church? Just talking as a pastor, it blows my mind that people spend more time thinking about shopping or eating than they do about the church that they will attend. A church, for me, the church is the biggest priority within my life. I know that you don't work at the church. But the church that you attend to should be something that challenges you. I asked a guy one day, what church do you go to? And he told me, I'm not going to tell you the name of the church, but he told me the name of the church. I said, I said, I said why do you go to the church there? He said this, the pastor is hip. <laughs> you go to a church because the pastor is hip. The cool church. And I said, well, could I be cool? He goes, no, you're way too old to be cool. I said, well, thank you. I said, no, really, why do you go to the church? He goes, really? The pastor's cool. And I looked at him, and I thought, wow. Dude, going to church has nothing to do with the pastor. Going to church has everything to do with Jesus. And when you go to a church because the church is cool or the pastor's cool but you're not getting Jesus and him crucified, get out of that church. Leave that church. So I want to tell you a couple things. 
if you were coming to this church, this church may not be your church. This church may not be what you look for. But there are many people that this church is exactly who God has called them to come. And if, you're, if God didn't call you here, go find a church where you can go all in. The purpose of the church is not for the pack to place out. The purpose of the church is for you to get totally in for the cause of Jesus Christ. And I want to give you four things that if you're looking at the church, if you're looking at a church, and if this church does not fulfill these four things, you should leave this church. You should fire me as the pastor if we do not do these four things. The first thing is the word. Find out that the church, if it preaches Jesus and the word of God. If the church that you attend or the church that you're looking at does not preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, does not preach the word of God from page to page, whether we like it or we don't like it, this is what the Bible says, and not be afraid to communicate truth, even in the face of somebody that is living in sin, we still have to preach truth no matter what. If the word of God is not preached, leave that church. If the word of God is not preached here, we are doing Jesus a very strong injustice. And then worship. It doesn't matter what style of worship. But worship is a conduit between my heart and God. Worship is an opportunity for us to sing, us to pray, us to teach. If we do not have the, the tool that I can get connected with God and we can worship God. I don't care if it's traditional. I don't care if it's contemporary. I don't care if it's country. I don't care if it's bluegrass. It's just music. Music is a conduit. Some of us like different stuff. But what we have to do is agree that the job of the church is to worship Jesus. He desires our praise and our worship. If we cannot worship God in this church... If you come into church and you're sitting here and you're folded your arms and you're sitting and you're sour and you're soaking and, and you're mad, go to a different church. Find a church where you can worship because just learning about God but not being able to worship Him, Jesus says He inhabits the praise and the worship of His church. I think Justin's doing a great job in the music. I, give him a round of applause. But worship is not music. Worship is your heart to God. He could do the greatest job in worship, but if it's a little too loud, we get mad. If it's a little too long, we get upset. Ooh, I, Lord, I don't want to worship you for five minutes. Now, I'll do it for three minutes. In some cases for Justin, I'll do it for 20 minutes. But the job of the church is to worship Jesus. Not to set sour and soak and be upset because it's not a preference. So churches, I say this with all due respect, we have lost more people at this church in the area of music than any other area in the last 20 years. And I want to say this. I love my Lord. And I want to worship my Lord. And if somebody's upset because of music, a pastor should never say this from the pulpit, but I'm going to say it anyway. Find a church that you enjoy and go to that church and go all in. Now, I want you to come to church here. I really do. But what I really more desire than you to come to church here is that you go all in for Jesus somewhere. The body of Christ is more important than Glenville Church. The body of Christ is every church. But find a church where you can love, that you can worship, that shares the word of God, allows us to worship. And the third thing is witness. A church where you can go as, a, as an unbeliever. And by the time that you leave that church service, that you know that Jesus Christ was glorified. If you can go to a church and they don't mention Jesus. They don't mention how to get saved. They don't mention anything about the Lord. Don't go to that church. Because that church has become a country club for, for saved. But it has no idea how to win somebody to Jesus. See, Jesus died for the church. For you and me. But Jesus died for those that are not in the church. 
And the job of the church is to be a witness to those outside when they come in the doors. We're going to be different. We're going to sing weird songs. We're going to talk to them about Jesus and they're going to be offended in some areas. But what we must do is we must never water down the gospel of Jesus Christ when it talks about the word, talks about the worship, and talks about the witness. We, the body of Christ, has the greatest power upon the planet because we're serving Jesus and the Holy Spirit lives within us and we need to be the witnesses, not only here, but also in our community and in states and around the world. Does your church witness about Jesus? And then, let me give you the last one. Work. If you come to church here, I am not going to be ashamed to tell you, get off your seat and find a place to serve. There will never give you any more purpose in life than to serve somebody that's struggling. To serve somebody, to serve the body of Christ, to serve Jesus. We need to not just come to church, but we need to serve each other. Service, I, I get to help. I get to encourage. I get to change people's lives. There's not a greater need upon our life than to feel the need of service. I get to help. There's 200 people here tonight that's going to get a t-shirt because they served in this church. But there's 500 people within the church. Hmm. Hmm. So about a third of the church is all in, right? Yeah. What we must do, if we're going to be the body of Christ, we must go all in. If the church is going to be who it needs to be, we need to go all in. God wants us to do something great. God wants the church to change the world. I understand that. But God has called me to teach you how to go all in. What does that mean? That means I need to demonstrate. I need to live my life as you do yours in front of your kids in front of your spouse. What does it mean to go all in? One of the things that's hard to do is to do things that you don't know how to do. Sometimes God calls us to go all in things that you have no idea how to do. And sometimes you look very stupid in doing certain things. The, the, the guys in Osborne this week, they were laughing at me. Because I told them, I said, I brought all my tools. <laughs> this is what I brought. I brought all, I don't know how to sheetrock. I've never sheetrocked in my life. And Justin over here is a builder and he's, he brings all these tools and they're doing all this stuff. And Tim Ford and him are organizing and, and making all this stuff happen. And they, what do you want me to do? And Tim goes, I got the perfect job for you. Okay. He gave me this tool. And within five seconds, my hand was bleeding. <laughs> he goes, are you, are you that crazy? I said, well, I, 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 don't, know. I don't know. So I gave that tool to Dale and said, Dale, you need to do this one. So don't, don't let me do anything. So you know what I delegated myself to be? Is a sheetrock carrier. That's all I can do. I can carry sheetrock. The next morning, I couldn't even get up out of bed. <laughs> I'm 54 and fat, so I, it was a hard day. But encouraging, being encouragement to others means you can do things that maybe you don't know how to do. But when you can help and you can encourage and you can love it's a very sweet thing. Being encouragement, I want to share this last story. Christmas time, there's a little girl in this church. And uh, she got a little stuffed animal. It was a little fat little animal. And uh, the mom wrote me a note uh, the week after Christmas. And, and uh, the mom asked the little girl, said, what are you going to name your stuffed animal? She said, Pastor Bruce. <laughs> and I said... <laughs> She, I said, why'd they call it fat? Well, she said it was fat and fluffy. <laughs> I said, no, that is so sweet. That's such an encouragement to me. <laughs> and here's what the mom said. Said that she takes that little stuffed animal everywhere. And she holds that stuffed animal. And the first night after she held that stuffed animal, she told her mom this. I get to sleep with Pastor Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It may be a fat stuffed animal, but that's an encouragement that somebody loves 
somebody enough that they'll want to hold, they'll want to carry, and they want to call somebody out. Church, what we must do is we must be unified. We must be on the same page and going in the same direction. We must love each other unconditionally. We must call somebody out every once in a while. But we have to do that in the spirit of love. But what God has called us to do once we're unified is give others what you have. Let them see that we're going to go into our community, go into our life, go into our family, and share the love and the forgiveness of Jesus. My last challenge is this. If you don't know where your family is spiritually, you need to find out. I have testimonies all over the place where they have buried their family and they didn't know. And it's hard on them. I do funerals and I ask questions and they don't know. I want you to know where your family is spiritually. I want you to know that if your spouse or your kids, if they know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, you have no idea what life has to offer. But I guarantee you, when you're standing in front of a casket, and you don't know, it's very difficult. But there's one other thing you can say is you could ask them, and you can be the witness to them, and you can say, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And if something would take place, you can stand in front of that casket and talk to that preacher and say this, I know without a shadow of a doubt that he knew Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior because he gave me that testimony. And you know what that does during a funeral? That gives hope. That gives purpose. And guys, our job is not to come to church. Our job is to surrender everything we have to go all in for Christ. It's tough. It's tough to talk to people about Jesus. It's hard to be a witness every day of the week. But we represent our Lord Jesus Christ. We as the body of Christ need to go all in. Will you please stand to your feet? Dear Lord, I pray that you'll be with us today. And Lord, there's people in our lives that we need to share our faith with. There's people in this church that need to go all in. So Lord, I ask you to send the power of the Holy Spirit to convict us where we need to change, how we need to change, and give us a purpose and give us a plan to do what you've called us to do. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. At the start of the service, Rachel came up here. And Rachel said something that was very unique. She said, change. Sometimes we need to change the seats that we sit in. Or something that we need to do. If I was going to be completely honest with you today. There's something in your life. That you need to change. If Jesus. Is not the priority. Get off the stool. And allow God. To take over. And you're the only person that knows. Where you're in charge. And sometimes we just need to say. Lord I need your help. I need to listen to you. I need you to be in control of my life. And if there's areas in your life that you need to change, if there's an addiction that you're struggling with, if there's pride or arrogance that you're not willing to give over to God, God cannot bless us until we're first humble enough to Him to say, Lord, you're in charge. I need you to be in control of my life. I want to go all in for you. If you need Jesus, if you need Him to be your Lord of your life, you need to ask him to go all in and you'd be willing to sacrifice. But if you're a saved, if you're a member of this church, if you're a child of God, if there's things that you struggle with, you need to go all in. I guarantee you, you go all in, God changes your life. Let us sing this song. And the altars are open for you to minister to God and God can love you and touch you and help you. Our deacons will be down here to pray. If you need something, let God work within your life. The church, we need to go. Where? All in. Today. Start that day. Let's sing this song. Take these hands.